evening, everybody, and welcome along to this edition of Lair Confidential on LairMedia.tv. And our usual email is info at LairMedia.tv. And we have in the studio, remotely speaking, Claire Lopez. Welcome along, Claire, to the show, and we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Pat. I'm very glad to be with you. Now, Claire Lopez, as we go through the show, uh, she'll unfold and reveal all about herself. And we're scared. You grew up in Ohio. Yes, my home state is Ohio in the Midwest of the United States, um, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, yeah, the Cleveland Clippers. No, Cleveland something. I forget their names. Anyway, and you went, what kind of a family environment, what kind of family did you grow up in? Uh, a, a, a very large one, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm the oldest of six children, uh, and um, we That's are all cool. still... Uh, very close with one another, although our parents have passed on. Yes, and that, would that be unusual now? I mean, in Ireland, of course, I'm from a family of nine, and of course, that'd be very small where I came from, believe it or not, you know, in the 50s and 60s. So you thought six children would be big, would it, for a family? Well, it, it, it all depends on your resources, right? Yeah. So um, if you have a house that's not big enough and one bathroom, um, and not enough of anything, then six gets to be quite a bit. You know, two and three people to a single bedroom, <laughs> that sort of thing. I know people are amazed sometimes because I grew up with an outside bathroom, an outside toilet, so that was my beginning. Oh, okay, <laughs> things could be worse. So, I mean, um, here we are, we survived it. Anyway, and then you progressed along uh, to, you, you did your master's in Syracuse University, I, I know that from there. And what... When you were going through college yourself, had you a career path in mind? What, what actually were you interested in? Does yes, I, um, I was interested in uh, becoming a journalist. I loved writing yes. and I wanted to travel and see the world, but my parents uh, did not place a very strong value on education and they tried to talk me out of going to college. They, they didn't want me to get a higher education. Um, and so um, I had to go to the place that offered me <laughs> the most scholarship money. And unfortunately, um, that school, which turned out to be a very good one, Notre Dame College of Ohio, yeah. um, did not offer journalism as a major. And right. so I never became a journalist. So you majored in something else in Notre Dame that time, did you? Uh, instead, uh, they, they, they sort of cobbled together a... Um, a, a, a degree program for me and a couple of other girls, and we called it communications. Uh, oh, and then I, uh, I had a double major with French language also. And um, I, I did go to write uh, for the newspaper there and I became the editor of the newspaper eventually at the school too. Well, you had something to, to do you know, with, with what you were interested in. And then you pro progressed on and you did your master's in um, was communication and international relations, was it? Yes, uh, went to Syracuse University. And once again, I was fortunate enough um, to get a scholarship. I had a full uh, graduate assistantship. And um, there I, I, I chose international relations with a Russia focus to be uh, my master's degree. And um, what, what prompted that? And of course, at that stage, <laughs> when you were finished that, you, you, you probably had a had you still a good idea what you wanted to do uh, after that? Well, the travel part was still uh, something I very much wanted to do, right. but my uh, my thoughts had, had had shifted now to government service. Right, um, excellent. And, and and so that is you know eventually uh, the way that I went. And what was your your first posting there? Your first job in 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 that area? Well, uh, we had uh, recruiters coming to campus. Um, I suppose they do this everywhere. Yes. Uh, companies come to campus. Um, mm -hmm. You know, different government organizations come to interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, it so happens that the CIA came to campus to interview um, me and, and several others in our Russia program. And uh, that is, uh, that's where I wound up going. Well, now, so now uh, after a while, then you found yourself in the CIA. Tell me something, um, did you, obviously you'll give it a bit of thought, but what was the work, I, I, I know we can't speak in details about what people did, I understand that perfectly well, 
Well, what kind of a work environment were you in then, straight away, you found yourself in? Was it a large team you were around you? Well, I mean, it, it varies uh, quite a bit. Of course, um, you know, the, the headquarters of the CIA is located in Langley, Virginia. Yeah. Um, but uh, then we all, you know, we served overseas. And so I was in a whole lot of different places and environments overseas, uh, serving out of uh, U.S. embassies uh, in Africa. Oh, right. Central America, South America, Balkans, uh, many places around the world. What an exciting life. And uh, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot now. What, what countries or what areas of the world stand out for you say, gosh, I, I must go back there again? You know, um, I, I loved Kenya. Uh, it's just so beautiful. And I was lucky enough to get to see many of the game parks in Kenya. Right. Um, the animals, uh, fantastic. The wildebeest migration across the Serengeti Plain, oh unforgettable. Oh. Um, uh, and then it, it, I, I, uh, I have to say that I fell in love with a little country of Bulgaria on the Black Sea in Southeastern Europe. Beautiful. And um, I, I think a big, a big uh, factor in, in, in how you do in a country has to do if you can speak the language. And so we had language training before we went over um, <clears throat> and speaking the language uh, made a big difference in getting to know people, um, you know, getting out and about and spending time with people in restaurants and ski resorts and on the Black Sea and um, really enjoyed my time there. So you were able to get out and about and move relatively freely depending uh, on the country mm -hmm. you're in. And I think yeah. you're right, Claire, that, that's very important because I know myself when I go on holiday, I like to go into the countryside. I don't mean to be disparaging. Meet the people, the only people who are residing there and making a living there. And that's how you get to know the country and the people as you write. Mm -hmm. and of course, you I mean, you had other, you had a sensitive job. Um, then how long did you spend in the CIA? 20 years. Oh my goodness me. And did you have to sign, can you say, did you have to sign all these things when you finished your work there or your, your term there? You know that you, uh, that you, uh, wouldn't you you wouldn't speak about certain events or certain things you were involved in sensitive things. Uh, well, no, but I, but 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 after after the agency, I, I went into the private sector. I've been out of government service now for twenty one years. Oh my god! Um, and I began to um, <clears throat> work in various um, federal contracting companies um, as a as an analyst. Um, you know, as a um, an intelligence analyst uh, for, for these different companies. And then I gravitated uh, to the think tank world. Uh, and uh, right. we, we after 9-11, especially, of course, right. this uh, became a focus. Middle East took the place of Russia in my focus, yeah. uh, and especially Iran, um, and uh, did a describe, lot of- uh, Would you describe Iran as a rogue state? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the United States, is, as, as you and your listeners probably know, we designate Iran as the foremost state sponsor of terrorism, Islamic terrorism in the world. I know I was speaking recently to an attache from Lebanon. I'm sure you're familiar with Lebanon. And uh, he, he didn't have uh, a lot of love for it, for to put it a better way anyway. But um, anyway, that country has been devastated by infiltration of uh, Hezbollah and all those. I don't have to tell you all about that. You're involved with the Center for Security Policy. Tell us a little bit about that. So the Center for Security Policy is a national security think tank uh, in Washington, DC. And I first became a fellow uh, there, a senior fellow from 2010 until 2014. And then from 2014 until 2020 last year, um, <clears throat> I came on board as a full-time employee as the vice president for research and analysis. And the Center for Security Policy, obviously analysis and uh, having your finger on the pulse of what's happening. Now, there's been a change of government in your country uh, recently from one uh, regime to another, from President Trump to uh, President Biden. And... Obviously, um, you would have, would you have a lot of analysis on the communist state called China? Well, yes. Um, during, during this past year of 2020, when we 
all of us probably spent, uh, you know, so much time at home. Um, I had a lot of time to do a deep dive into China, which had never been a focus for me before. Um, but it's but surprising it, really because it's probably one of the biggest threats in the world today. Because of the absolutely world. yes, and and so I did a lot of reading about China. Uh, read many wonderful authors. I mean, I began with Sun Tzu and uh, the Art of War, which I'd never read before. Uh, all the way on up to Mao's Little Red Book, uh, and in between that, uh, <laughs> books by wonderful scholars like Michael Pillsbury. Uh, Gordon Chang, uh, retired General Robert Spaulding, uh, retired Speaker of our House in our Congress, Newt Gingrich. I'm just now finishing um, Henry Kissinger's magnum opus. I mean, it is yay thick, almost 600 pages, I think. Uh, it's well, called you're... On China. And where did you get the time to read all that? I mean, I like to read myself, but it takes time, obviously. But of course, with the lockdown, with the way the, the, the world economies are paralyzed, you know, which is shocking in one level. I don't know. I don't really know what the answer is to myself. But uh, I oh, want to I ask mean, you a question. How is uh, Newt Gingrich? He's one politician that I always admired, you know, irrespective of party politics. I just, yeah, I always felt... He was a straight talker. He didn't, yes. he wasn't a pretense politician. He wasn't a politician, a populist, what you call, I better say the right thing here. I think he, I, I, he struck me as that type from this remove from him anyway, you know, and I thought, you know, I, it was a pity that someone like the caliber of him never made it as president. That's only my opinion, of course. Well, I, 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 I have the wor a world of respect for, for uh, former speaker Newt Gingrich. I think he is one of the most insightful, uh, sharpest, uh, uh, patriotic uh, politicians we've had in, in my lifetime. Right. Um, he's still active. Um, we still see him um, very often as a guest commentator on uh, different shows. That's right. Uh, and as I said, he, he did just write this book, I think last year or the year before, um, about, about the China threat. And uh, he's very sharp, very insightful about yeah. what this um, communist Chinese party means for the rest of the world, it's uh, not just shocking. the United States. It's shocking that there's not more attention paid because they're buying up the whole of Africa. They buy ports, you know, a vital infrastructure for different countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a documentary recently on them. I, I'm flabbergasted the influence that they have in the United Nations and the influence that they have in the World Health Organization, which is just utterly, I, I don't know myself, America itself is a country. I know America itself today, Claire, I don't have to tell you, you live there, is very, very divided, at, politically speaking, do you think itself? Do you think it will be able to ever restore itself as what we call a world power again? Uh, yes, I do think so. Um, yes, you're right. Right now, we're, we're deeply conflicted. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, we, we have an administration in power right now that is uh, deeply beholden uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, which uh, puts us in a terribly vulnerable position. Yeah. But, but China has been... Uh, rising uh, for, for quite a number of decades. Um, uh, the leadership in China views the centuries of 1800s, 1900s, um, as, as an, uh, and into the 20th century um, as, as, a, as a time of a weakness uh, for them. Uh, and they, they, they feel that now they are beginning to rise back to the, what they would see as their rightful position in the world and honestly, what they think, and they say this out loud, uh, the leadership does, um, that they believe themselves to be uh, the rightful hegemon or the ba uh, of the entire world. They are uh, the kingdom under heaven, and they think that they should dominate all under heaven. Um, this is evident uh, in their statements. It's evident in the Belt and Road Initiative that you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, establishing outposts, um, developing infrastructure in, in places around the world. But then, of course, when the country's uh, budgets cannot cannot pay back uh, what's been invested, then what happens? 
uh, Beijing takes control of whatever road or railway, railway or port that yeah, they've just yeah. constructed, and then they own it. This yeah. is part of their 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 plan. So it's it's also a military buildup, uh, especially concerning um, their their militarization of space, uh, from which all future warfare on Earth uh, will be uh, determined and directed. Uh, their domination in technology, um, and then couple all of that with their horrific human rights abuse record oh. at home, um, the abuse of their own people, uh, and people who don't really want to be their own people, who have been conquered by their empire, the Tibetans. Uh, certainly, we've seen what happened to the Hong Kong Democrat freedom fighters, um, oh, yeah, constant yeah. threats against Taiwan. Yeah. So all of that combined makes uh, China a very serious threat. And despite the fact, this is my opinion, of course, I'm expressing here, not the opinion of Blair Media, despite the fact, in my opinion, they have tried to buy respectability around the globe, mm. which to any serious-minded thinking politician or person or country that would put two and two together. I mean, you cannot do that. I mean... I don't know, uh, Claire, myself, I despair sometimes because a strong America, not because you're on and you're from America, but a strong America was always a foil, was always a break that, you know, put on these despots. I, I don't think Russia is the worry anymore economically, you know. It's not uh, a global power anymore, in my opinion, you know, because the, the economy is wrecked. They have no economy worthwhile as far as well, I Well, I mean, it's still a very strong nuclear power and its nuclear yes. arsenal, yes. including tactical nukes and cruise missile delivery vehicles, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, is, is still proceeding and in some ways far more advanced than our own uh, yeah. programs in, in the United States. But you're right about the demographics and the economics of Russia by contrast uh, with, with China. You're yes. right about that. I mean, China wouldn't consider Russia uh, a formidable foe anymore. That's my view of it. I know what for what it's I, Well, I wonder if, if perhaps some of your, your viewers might have seen uh, a, a speech given not so long ago, maybe it was towards the end of 2020, um, but by a senior academic, a dean, um, of academic uh, affairs uh, of, of a particular school of, of uh, the Renmin University in China. His name was uh, Di Dao Sheng. And uh, the, the, the film professionally videotaped, it was meant to be seen and, and, and to be disseminated around the world. Um, this, uh, this professor uh, is in an auditorium speaking to a large audience. It, it may be at the university and it's a very appreciative audience. They're clapping and laughing along. And he's openly admitting uh, that the Chinese Communist Party dominated America's elite, infiltrated all of our power centers like Wall Street, meaning our ec economic uh, centers, our academic centers, dominated uh, our political leadership. And then he says something interesting. He said, until Trump came along and then, and then we couldn't do it anymore. And well, uh, they had to get rid of Trump for that reason. And he admits this straight up and openly in the speech. It's on, it's on a video, it's on, a, on the internet. I'm sure it can be found, Professor yeah. uh, and D. Dao Sheng. And you know, uh, Claire, Four years, I think, is a very short time for a president of America to try and do anything, you know, because the, the ship is so big, even to turn the ship around somewhat, even to 20 or 30 degrees takes an awful lot of effort. I think, that, I think the one thing Donald Trump had going for him is, number one, I know it's a cliche, he wasn't a politician. He was a businessman, successful businessman. And I think that it was a shame that he didn't get a second term because, as you know, I don't have to tell you, Claire, that some companies he didn't allow to be listed in Wall Street because they were owned by Chinese money, backed by Chinese money, as you know. You know, there was a big mm -hmm. in financial circles about that. And he did take them on, or tried to take them on, for the stealing of all these, um, uh, what do I call it, these Intellectual brands. property. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I thought he did it. He did as much as he could have within the short mm -hmm. space of time he had, you know. I've Agreed. never seen a president that uh, 
mainstream media, I don't want to say mainstream media, but the main media, both in print and television, was consistently and persistently over these four years. There is no, there is nobody, I, I, I don't know how the man is standing, ir irrespective of his politics and all that people might, on a human level, I have no idea how the man is standing after four years of that. He's a remarkable individual. Uh, uh, um, I, I am certain we have not seen the last of President Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, but what really wrecked uh, the last year of his administration, last year, 2020, of course, was when the Chinese Communist Party unleashed, um, you know, the, uh, the the virus out of the uh, out of Wuhan on the world. Now we know, of course, that China has a massive biological weapons program. It doesn't get nearly enough attention uh, in true. the media, that but they true. develop all kinds of horrific biological warfare agents. Uh, they use the most modern. Uh, laboratory genetic uh, modification techniques like CRISPR. And they were working on coronaviruses, plural, because that's a family of viruses, yeah. for a long time. Now, whether this one got out by accident or on purpose, I don't know. But once it got out, and it got out, it, it, it got out certainly in China, in, in Wuhan, the capital of Hubei province, got yeah. in the central southern part of China, yeah. uh, in late 2019, and they knew it. The Chinese were vaccinating their own people against this virus no later than November, December of 2019. And then they allowed it deliberately to be unleashed on the world. And it got everywhere, Europe, Ireland, certainly. Yep. And of course, the United States. And uh, it's been devastating. It, it's it absolutely has, been devastating. It has been devastating. It's been, been devastating for people of my own age in their late 60s, early 70s, you know? And it's been, it's devastated. I mean, there are countries now, economically speaking, I don't think they'll come back, certainly in my lifetime, again to what they were, which is absolutely appalling altogether, you know? Well, what, yeah. I, I mean, what I would say is it, it, it's not the virus itself that's had this devastating effect. It's a virus like any other. It's a lot like a flu. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a type of flu. Um, the, the, the devastation has been wreaked by governments at every level. And in the United States, I'm talking about our state level governors, our city mayors, um, who, uh, you know, found their inner tyrant and um, instituted measures that let them seize tyrannical power over people, locking down Oh. entire cities and businesses oh, and yeah. schools I, I tell you, with yeah. absolutely no need to do it. No. Because this, why? Yeah. Because we have drugs to treat it. You don't need to lock anything down and a I vaccine mean, is nice to have. You don't need it, but it's nice to have. We have drugs. Yeah. We have both prophylactic and therapeutic drugs that include hydroxychloroquine uh, in combination with zinc, azithromycin, ivermectin, budesonide. The Israelis have just apparently um, uh, discovered and, and tested very successfully a brand new drug uh, that's that's incredibly successful. Um, we've got drugs to treat this. We, we don't need the hysterical they're, response. They're, they're a fantastic country for its size. Israel, I'm talking about now. Mm. Tipped on there. I was there. Yes. My daughter, my daughter worked. I was there. But they're an unbelievable country for for what they had been through not so very long ago. But I know myself in Ireland with this pandemic is the first time in my lifetime that healthy people were locked, were taught to stay locked up yeah. and wear a mask, healthy people. I never yeah. heard in my lifetime. I'm not a doctor or anything. I'm an artist or so, but I, I kind of still get my head around it. You know? No, it makes no sense. Makes sense. Because it has no sense. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think people realize how tiny a virus is. Yeah. Uh, between 0.1 and 0.3 microns, which is about a thousand times smaller than the openings in the cloth mesh weave of these stupid little masks people wear. I know. Um, it, it, it's it's uh, as, as Dr. Simone Gold, uh, a, a prominent doctor here in the United States with a group called America's Frontline Doctors, as she has said, uh, it's like putting up a chain link fence to keep the mosquitoes out. 
<laughs> I love that one, all right, you know. <laughs> They're smart mosquitoes, smart virus, because it recognizes, I, I look, we won't go into the virus because in this country, there's more and more people now in the medical field speaking out against the measures that our government has taken because it makes no scientific sense. To me, if it doesn't make, if it doesn't have science, if something that you're being taught doesn't have the science to back it up, to me, it's just made up ridiculous carry on. Claire Lope is our, is our special guest here on there, Confidential, and we're glad to have you there. Tell us a bit about um, the Clarion Project. Uh, well, the Clarion Project is uh, a think tank, um, national security focused think tank in uh, the United States. Um, I formerly was a, a senior fellow, a writer for them for, for a, a short period of time. Yeah. Um, but they, they went off the rails some time ago and um, uh, not, not terribly credible anymore. So um, right. I and haven't you know, followed them much. The one, thing, the one thing that America is blessed with is, well, apart from people like yourself, is they have these think tanks, which are very important because we don't have a tradition of that certainly in the Republic of Ireland, you know? Mm. So we either, you, you have a government and then you have everyone else against it. I don't mean to be that blasé about it, but we don't have, in the, we do have independent thinkers, all right? Uh, I, I, you know, there's no doubt about that. We don't have this uh, think tank culture where you mm -hmm. could put some of that energy to good use if you follow my drift. And I think, I think that's a deficit, certainly in, in our country anyway, you know, but it's being remedied somewhat. Now, the, you um, would be someone who have who has, um, I suppose, been a strong. Um, I would try to use the word here, a strong opponent of the brand of Islam coming out of Iran, or should I say, a people, should I say, um, committing some atrocities in the name of Islam, because there is a difference between the religion and the people who are purporting to be followers of the religion and to be carrying out these acts in the name of religion. Would you agree with that? Well, I would, I would perhaps put it a little bit differently. There is one Islam. Uh, there is only one Islam. Uh, it is the Islam of Quran, of the Sunnah, which is the collections of Hadiths, and the Sirah, the biography of Muhammad, and the law, the Islamic law, Sharia. Right. If what people do and say aligns with the doctrine of Quran, Sunnah, and Sharia, uh, they are devout and faithful followers of Islam. If what they say and do does not align with the canon of Islam and the scholars of Islam through the centuries, then those people are not uh, following, they are not devout and true and faithful followers of Islam. Now in Iran, uh, the leadership are very devout, true followers of Shiite Islam, one of the two, you know, great uh, no, sects uh, within, uh, within Islam. Because, yeah, that's right, yeah. And um, they have a particular um, uh, set of doctrines that, that differs somewhat from the Sunni side, but in all the major areas, they're exactly the same. They, uh, they believe in jihad. They believe in Jew hatred. Uh, they believe uh, in, uh, I mean, read their constitution. I, I really recommend people to read the Iranian constitution. It's in English, it's online. And uh, it dedicates uh, the regime in, in Tehran uh, to jihad, that is uh, warfare, to spread Islam and Islamic oh, rule yeah. mm -hmm. throughout the entire world. And it designates in the Iranian constitution, it designates the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, as an ideological army. That's what they call it. And they say its job is not just to protect the borders of Iran, but to spread Islam and Islamic law throughout the entire world. And then in that uh, particular section of their constitution, they quote, the Quran from verse 860, which says, um, make ready your forces to the utmost of your ability, including steeds of war um, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemy. Now this is straight out of the Quran. So obviously this is a regime that that is completely and totally faithful to, uh, to uh, Islamic doctrine and the Quran. 
And uh, uh, my special guest, of course, is uh, Claire Lopez, all the way from, where are you residing now, Claire? Is it in Washington? I, I live in the, in, the, in the DC metro area, yes. Ex exactly. And now, has America, excuse me, America has full diplomatic relations with the Republic of Iran, I presume? Oh, no, good grief, no. No? No, no. I'm only putting you on the spot there now. Why? And has Iran a presence in America at any official level? Not an official level, but they have, of course, a mission at the United Nations um, uh, in, in New York City, of course. Yes. Uh, but they yes. have no uh, embassy or diplomatic facilities. Um, but they, all, they do have their operatives all throughout the country. And in, indeed, um, especially their terror proxy operatives from Hezbollah operate throughout the United States uh, in various ways. Uh, criminality, narco-trafficking, um, the pre-attack casing and surveillance of American and, of course, Israeli and Jewish targets, too. And, of course, uh, would there, of course, if they were attached to the United Nations, it would afford them some diplomatic um, protection in America, would it? Uh, within limits. Um, the, yeah. the delegation uh, in uh, New York City is circumscribed by the... Um, uh, the the, the uh, area in which they are allowed to travel uh, without any kind of special permission. Um, they are confined to uh, a close area around New York City. Um, uh, but um, they have diplomatic uh, status at the United Nations. But uh, time and again, uh, when those diplomats, so-called, from Iran have been discovered by, by our national security, uh, to have been violating the terms of their diplomatic status, right. um, they are ejected. They are PNG'd, as we say, perso made persona non grata. And why do you think, Claire, and I think it's awful, we just touched on it earlier on in the chat, this anti-Semitic sentiment, this anti-Semitic thing that bubbles up now and again against a tiny, tiny, tiny country in the Middle East? Because when you look at the totality of the square miles of the Middle East, and you see the amount of territory that um, Israel takes, it's uh, it's like a top of yeah. a pen. Yeah, I've what? been to Israel many times. Um, yeah. It's a marvelous, wonderful country. Yeah. Um, but but here 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 is why uh, there is so yeah, much. What I want to say, Claire, oh. is, is, it, is it ignorance? Because I was there like no, you. No, it's not ignorance. But everybody, anybody who's a citizen, in the Knesset, you have Arabs, Marshal yeah. Arabs, you have Palestinians, you have uh, every type of person who has been a citizen of Israel can stand for parliament and sit in it. Men or women, Absolutely. Who are. you know, it's an extraordinary country. Well, uh, it's an extraordinary country and an extraordinary people. Absolutely. Um, a powerhouse in uh, any field you want to pick, uh, agriculture, Absolutely. medicine, technology. But here's the thing. Uh, we're back to the Quran again. Uh, it is because Muhammad. Ask any time you want to know why somebody is doing something, ask what would Muhammad do, right? So Muhammad uh, in his era, uh, which is the seventh century Arabian Peninsula, yeah. um, fought against uh, not just pagan tribes then uh, there, but, but also uh, three very large and prosperous tribes of the Jewish people. Uh, the Banu uh, 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 Kenuka, the Banu Nadir, and the Banu Kareja, and um, obliterated them, absolutely obliterated them from the peninsula. Uh, and because that was the example of Muhammad, and because the Quran, which M Muslims believe is the direct and literal word of Allah, of God, I mean, literally word for word, and because uh, in the Quran it says that Muhammad, multiple places, it says that Muhammad is the perfect man. The Ansar al-Kamil is, is in Arabic, the perfect man. Anything that Muhammad ever did or said in his life is therefore doctrine for all Islam, for all Muslims, for all time. True. And so uh, Jew uh, hatred mm -hmm. is doctrinal to Islam. Jews are supposed to be dhimmi people, the Ahlad dhimma uh, in the Quran, meaning the conquered people, those subjugated to Islam, and furthermore, the land of, of Israel, uh, the ancient 
5,000 year old homeland of the Jewish people was at one point conquered by the forces of Islam, which makes according to its doctrine, that land, what they would call sacred space. Any land ever conquered or occupied by Islam, Islamic forces uh, is forever waqf as they say, meaning land endowed in perpetuity by Allah to Muslims. And if it's ever lost, um, as the Iberian Peninsula, let's say, or the subcontinent of Asia in India, for example, uh, or uh, the homeland of Israel itself, and, and it's lost to Islam, and the Jewish people stand up for themselves and become independent and free and prosperous, uh, this is anathema, as they would say, a Nakba, catastrophe. And, and so on those two things, Muhammad, and then of course the combination of uh, they are supposed to be conquered, subjugated, dimmy people, and the, the doctrine of sacred space, it must forever be fought against to be obliterated once again. That's why. And of course, there are people, you're dead right, there are people, Muslims, who would follow a lot of that literally as well from the Quran, the teachings of the Quran, and it's manifested, as I said, in these horrific um, jihadi acts that we've had down through history. There's no doubt about that. Now, have you been in a mosque yourself? Yes, yes. And uh, I don't know how many. I didn't. I forgot to look it up. I don't know how many Muslims are living in the United States. I've no about idea. three point, uh, maybe three million, something in that range. So they're, they're yeah. They're, so they're uh, hmm. a barely, uh, maybe one percent of our overall population, which is approximately three hundred. 30 million or so, roughly speaking? Now, I mean, when, when it comes to religion and politics, well, religion especially, uh, you know, if religion is not a force of good, you're better off forgetting about it. Isn't that what somebody said? I forget who said that. If it's not a force of Might good. Might have been Lenin. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but perhaps of Vladimir <laughs> Ilyich. I don't know. Certainly some wise men that went before us anyway. <laughs> but, um, before we finish this little chat, I mean, you're living in America and you're making your living in America today and you've traveled a lot and you've seen a lot and you have what I call a worldly view, you know, and you've seen many different nationalities in many countries. Now, your hope for the United States right now, this minute, as, as you're sitting here, I know it's easy to despair about, as we talk about the COVID thing and all of that. Do you think that America is in a good place right now, both politically and culturally itself as a country? You know, we've talked about the divisions within our country, and that's certainly true. But I will tell you this. In America are millions upon millions upon tens of millions of American citizen patriots um, who believe in the foundational principles of our republic. Those principles derive from enlightenment principles that, that we inherited from, from European uh, yeah. philosophers and before that from Athens, from Rome, the Republican period of Rome. Um, and those principles include um, uh, first things principles as we call them, individual liberty, um, the equality of everyone before the, the law. Um, that is why we are a republic, we are not a democracy. And republic comes from the Latin, two words, res publica. Res means the thing, publica public. What is the public thing in America? It's the law. Yeah. Uh, consent, uh, government by consent of the governed. These, these are our hallowed principles to be found in our Declaration of Independence. Uh, and, then, and then later uh, in, in, in other documents, we have Federalist Papers, of course, the Constitution, Bill of Rights. Um, and so these are the things that, that Americans uh, still hold dear, we treasure, and we are going to defend uh, against the forces of Marxism and communism that currently dominate our institutions. We're going to, we're going to get that back. And we um, are going to reestablish the principles uh, that we hold most sacred, most dear, uh, our foundational principles of our foundation, our founding fathers, uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and all of the rest. And did you ever think of uh, 
running for office yourself, public office? No, I, I don't see myself in that role. Um, I, uh, I, I, I just don't have uh, any uh, inclination to uh, be a, a politician. Yeah, it, 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 it's a different skill set. I think anyway, um, Claire, that uh, America itself today, I think the American people in general, who I met here in this country, I haven't, of course, as soon as the travel ban is lifted, we hope to get over there. But I mean, I think it's still a fantastic, and I'm not saying this because I'm speaking to you from America, I'm saying this genuinely heartfelt. It's still an amazing country with amazing people and amazing opportunities if you want to work hard. Despite the political divisions at the top, I think down on the ground, it's still a fantastic country because people have to get on with day-to-day -day living anywhere, regardless of who's in power or who's perceived to be in power. But are you hopeful politically as well that it will eventually build itself up again? Yes, absolutely I am. And, and again, that is because I think the vast majority uh, of our hundreds of millions of Americans are true citizen patriots um, who, who, who value those foundational principles I was just talking about. Uh, they reject communism, Marxism, Maoism that are running rampant through our institutions today. And, and I'll tell you what, one of the side effects you might say of, of being locked down and, and stuck at home, uh, parents who, who, who are not able to go out to work, um, their businesses may be closed, children who are not able to go to school, is that parents became more involved in their own children's education, looking over their shoulders at that computer screen as the children were doing distance learning, right? Yes. And I'll tell you what, a lot of what parents saw absolutely horrified them and galvanized them to become more involved in their local school boards, and in closer supervision of what their children were actually learning. Yes. Uh, and I think that is one small silver lining to this great big cloud of the last year uh, that is well worth uh, pursuing. Let me mention one more thing that uh, I think is uh, tremendously helpful and encouraging. President Trump uh, established something here in the United States last year uh, called uh, the 1776 Commission. 1776, of course, the year of our independence. Yeah. And uh, the commission was formed of senior uh, patriotic scholars led by President Larry Arne of Hillsdale College and many other wonderful scholars, mm -hmm. Victor Davis Hanson and others. But as a response to something called uh, the 1619 Project launched by the uh, New York Times, um, which purports to show America's founding as 1619, the year the first African slaves were brought to this country when we were still colonies under the British Empire at that time. Yeah. Um, and so the 1776 Commission was formed. The final report of the 1776 Commission just came out, I think a few weeks ago in January, 2021 here. Um, it's, it's, uh, it was removed immediately from the White House website by the Biden team, uh, but it can still be found online with a search 1776 final report, uh, 1776 commission final report. It's a beautiful document uh, that attests to uh, those principles we need to uh, encourage and foster in our education, mm. uh, not just of children, K through 12 university, but of all of our citizens. I, I really recommend that. Well, now uh, for our listeners, uh, and we will indeed give, uh, get a link up in our, uh, on the program when this finishes, the 1776 Commission. I had heard about it, but I didn't think it had reported at all, you know? So it's something we should pursue. Claire, it's been absolutely fantastic and for your time and for your patience. Indeed, we haven't only scratched the surface. You'll have to come back again with us. Glad and, to. Uh, <laughs> when you get a chance in a couple of weeks time we'd love to have you back again but Very for this to come yeah, back absolutely again. but for this edition of Lear Confidential and my special guest Claire Lopez for taking the time out of her day thank you very much Claire for being with us and uh, we'll hope to see you again very soon mm -hmm.